Welcome to Working for Women, the independent women's forum podcast, where we are changing the conversation about women and public policy for the better. Hi, my name is Patrice Anruga, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. Today, I'm joined by Julie Gunlock, who's the director of, cult- of the Cultural Alarmism Project here at IWF. She covers topics related to culture and parenting. You know, one of the most relevant topics today is about guns and school safety, especially in light of the mass shooting in Parkland, Florida. So we're about one week away from walkouts and planned rallies nationwide. Um, and, and I think it's good for us to have a conversation about how we ensure school safety and, and solutions around that. Uh, but let's also talk about the failure of government and systems that have already been in place, which led to the loss of so many lives at that high school. You know, we just want to say that we are, are so sorry for all of the people who've lost children and family members in that tragedy, and hopefully we don't see this repeated. So, Julie, um, welcome to the program. Let's talk about this. Uh, thank you, and that's a great setup for what we're going to talk about. This is an emotional issue. It is, it is um, understandable that people are looking for solutions, and I think in, at moments like this when you're dealing with an emotional topic, sometimes, you know, there's this sort of just do something, right? We see that out there a lot. It's mm-hmm. even a hashtag, do something, and what we need to examine is what is that something? What are we going to do, and will it actually work? And I think that if you look at what the, the, the laws that are already on the books, the regulations, um, the measures that are there to protect people and to prevent um, people like Nicholas Cruz, uh, the shooter in Parkland, um, from getting weapons, um, you realize, like, look, there's already a, a, a structure in place, uh, a very good structure. Guns are already heavily regulated. The problem is, 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 is that they're, they're, it's not often used. Um, and we can get a little bit into that, but I think, I think your intro was good. And again, I think we should all have compassion, certainly for the, the children who are calling um, uh, for, uh, you know, um, protests and walkouts and, and, and the parents and, and people who are saying, you know, Congress has to do something. I think that is an understandable position, but it's really important as policy folks that we look at what are those solutions and what will they do and will they actually solve the problem? Uh, and, you know, that's a good way to, to talk about some of the problems, some of the failures of this specific incident, because, I mean, as you right. rightly laid out, you know, there were some, there were, there, there already are laws in place. This happened in a gun-free zone. So, you know, let's, let's look at some of the, the failures here. And I think you really addressed one key failure, which is in, in, in terms of law enforcement. You had right. a fantastic piece in the Hill. Um, where you, it was scathing, but you, you really talk about the Broward County Sheriff, Scott Israel, you know, and yeah. his failure yeah. of leadership. And, you know, I'll tell you, when my husband and I watched him on, on television, we couldn't believe that he was trying to kind of clear his hands of, of everything that happened by, by uh, those folks who were on right. his team and, and pretending like he really wasn't the leader when he should have been. So please explain to us, you know, what exactly you said, why, why you think that there was a failure of leadership on the part of law enforcement? Sure. Well, let me tell you how, what, what actually exists. There's a, a system called NICS. It's N-I-C-S. And it, it's, it's the um, National Instant Criminal Background Check System. Okay, that's what NICS stands for. NICS is a system where if you go into a gun store and you want to purchase a gun, there's a there's a pretty lengthy process that you have to go through, one of which is a background check. The background check system is set up so that if the, the gun shop owner puts your name into the system, it will, t- it will flag you as, as you know, having either a criminal background, if you have, have been convicted of a felony, mm-hmm. if you have been adjudicated as, as mentally ill. So if you actually have, um, you know, if a social worker has gone to a judge and let's say, you know, you can't have um, – uh, access to your children, or you um, are, you know, ha- you had a restraining order because you're, you know, you're mm-hmm. making violent threats. Um, you can also domestic put domestic violence. Yes, domestic violence. You can also put reports into the NIC system of, for instance, a, a social worker visiting a home and, and noticing that someone is acting erratically. You can put um, uh, things in the NICS. For instance, um, what I found was that, that Nicholas Cruz, um, there were 45 times um, that either Broward County, Broward County Sheriff's Office or other city officials like social workers had visited the Cruz household for various reports of violence, of threats. 
Um, there were uh, calls coming into the sheriff's office about him having access to weapons. Um, so again, you have this system called the NICS, and again, it is really incumbent upon so both so the social workers and city officials and the police department to put information into the NICS. If that information isn't put into the NICS, it doesn't work. So. So here, so then, so knowing that, um, it is really amazing that Broward County Sheriff's Office failed to report to the NICS, the 45 and the social workers in the city of Broward County failed to put into the NICS the 45 times um, that Nick Cruz's family and he himself were visited. Um, it's not only that, the FBI actually received tips. They received phone calls saying that um, he's made threats to students. He has access to weapons. The FBI didn't put this into the NIC system. So again, we're all talking about what you hear among the people saying, do something, do something, do something, is that we have to restrict guns. We have to restrict guns. But we ha what we're, we're not, I see very little discussion of, of, of enforcing the laws that are already in place. And we see this in Washington a lot. When there's a problem, we just add more laws on top of existing laws so that essentially you get this sort of overlap and duplication, but there's never any oversight to look if the, if the laws that are already in place are actually being enforced. Um, so I think that's a frustration. And if I'm going to go, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I will take a breath here in a few minutes, but I want to say something about Scott Israel, <laughs> uh, Sheriff Scott Israel. When you watch him, you mentioned you and your husband watching it and just sort of being shocked. I think every parent, every sort of, <laughs> in my opinion, common sense, reasonable person watches Sheriff Israel and just their mouth is agape. It is amazing to me, his lack of contrition, his almost lack of, of, of sort of an awareness of what has occurred here and how his office failed that community multiple, mm -hmm. multiple times. Everybody knew about this kid. Everybody, the school officials, the police, the FBI, social workers, judges. I mean, what in the world else could have been done to prevent this? And none of this was put into the background check system. That is incredibly frustrating. So, look, I'm fine to have a conversation about do we, you know, look, these are, it's fine. In this country, we should welcome these conversations. Do we ban certain guns? Do we put harsher restrictions on certain weapons? Fine, have the conversation. But can we also have a conversation about the system that's already in place? That is not being discussed. And to me, that's, that's a recipe. That is a recipe for, for bad government. Well, and, and I think you, you're raising, uh, uh, unfortunately, what's going to be missing from a lot of the, um, the rallies and the walkouts and the planned um, activism mm -hmm. around this issue. You know, over the next few weeks, I think, in, including next week, we're going to start seeing uh, students uh, who are going to walk out um, in protest um, for that, that desire to do something. Right. Um, right. National school walkout is being planned. You know, I'd love to know what you make of, of these organized rallies. First, um, well, just generally as, as, as an observer, but then also as a parent, because I think you have a unique uh, example coming up in Arlington County where you live. That's absolutely right. It's actually, I live in, Ale I live in the city of Alexandria. And, um, oh, Alexandria. And, and, yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. Um, it's, I live in the city of Alexandria. And what's so shocking about my, my particular situation is, the city uh, school system, so the, the, the school district, Alexandria City Public Schools, the official office, is helping essentially to coordinate this. Um, they are instructing school principals of elementary schools. We're talking 5 to 11-year-olds, okay, at this school, which is insane. Why in the world such young children are being encouraged to protest this? And let's, let's, let's not pretend these are the kids. These are the parents pushing this and school administrators put, pushing this. They're using children as mm -hmm. props, as we've seen CNN do, and as we've seen groups like Moms Demand Action, and every town USA, which have no compunction about using children, even the children of Parkland who were victims of this shooting as props, going in on the in the media hours after the incident, giving this heart wrenching testimony. Um, there was there was no thought to like maybe it's not good to le to let these children, um, you know, to to use these children in this way. So I I am very dis sort of disgusted um, at seeing how these groups are in coordination with these uh, school districts are, are allowing this and encouraging this. In my situation, my children go to an elementary school. Um, they uh, have sent notes out saying this may happen. They're, they're trying very hard to appear that they're not supporting it. So they're saying things like, Mm -hmm. 
we are not, we are not, we're supporting students who walk out and, and students who choose to, to remain seated. Um, but it raises a lot of questions. First of all, you have principals sending emails out um, to parents, alerting them that this will happen. I didn't see this when the, the March for Life was happening in Washington, D.C. I didn't see this um, for, you know, if I, if I decide to organize, I doubt that the school would support me organizing a walkout for safe, you know, for better streets and lower taxes in Alexandria. Mm-hmm. They're very choosy about um, what what they're supporting. They're claiming this is about school safety. But again, these are very, very young kids. And, and in addition, what frustrates me, and I've, this has happened, um, uh, you know, in the notes that have come home, the, 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 the information given to parents is that this is a walkout to memorialize the 17 victims of Parkland. It is shocking to me that that is what they're saying this is, because if you go to the National Mm -hmm. Walkout website, okay, which is being organized by the Women's March, okay, this is now an extension of the Women's March, okay, if you go to that website, okay, I quote, it actually, it doesn't say anything about Memorial I mean, it says, like, we want to recognize the victims, but it then says, this walkout, we're organizing the National School Walkout to demand Congress pass legislation to keep us safe from gun violence in our schools and on our streets and in our homes. It's, it goes further. We are not safe in our schools. We're not safe in our cities and towns. Congress must take meaningful action to keep us safe and pass federal gun reform legislation that will address the public health crisis of gun violence. We want Congress to pay attention and take note. Many of us will vote this November and many others will join in 2020. This is a call for specific gun legislation, gun limits, restrictions on the AR-15, restrictions on certain people, on, you know, the, the, uh, basically the gun ownership in general. This is not just a memorial for the 17 victims. And so you have a public school using taxpayer dollars, um, coordinating with the National School Walkout Organization to agitate for specific legislation. I know that, that, that schools are, protect, are protected, school personnel are protected. It's a, it's a freedom of speech issue. There's a lot of case studies on this. But it does strike me as, as odd. I am a taxpayer in Alexandria. I don't, want, I don't want my schools agitating on pro-life issues. I don't want my schools agitating for lower taxes or for any of the conservative positions that I take. I don't want that. that I don't believe that's a place uh, for the schools. But I think the, the least they could do is be honest with parents that, these, that your student, if you allow your student, there's a lot of students who are well-meaning here who want to, again, memorialize those 17 victims. This is not it. What they will do is they will take pictures and take footage of all these protests and all these little kids walking out, and the National School Walkout Organization, along with the Women's March, will promote this as look at how many people are promoting stricter gun laws. That is what's being done, and parents should know that. They should know the real meaning behind this before they allow their children to be used as a prop by these radical organizations. I just believe that parents deserve the truth, and and they're not getting it. Uh, Julie, you are absolutely right. You know, looking at, you know, who's really behind this, it seems it's it's being presented as being student entirely student run organized and 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 driven but it is in fact you know the women's march and an extension of um of of kind of a of a of a leftist progressive yeah. agenda that is really looking towards the 2018 election cycle it's looking towards 2020 it's looking toward yeah. mobilization and re, kind of yeah. rebuilding this grassroots effort and i think you're very right for to raise the alarm for parents to understand yeah. what they are saying yes to when they sign a permission slip that comes home just from school you right. know, and what they really should be thinking about it and, well, and whether and- they want their children to participate and I will, I will tell you, just last thing, I know we're wrapping up here, but I will tell you, you know, Alexandria City Public Schools, I'm really disappointed in their activism. But in Baltimore, they are, they are, they are organizing buses to transport students. So we're seeing yeah. this. It's not just here. It's, it's nationwide. And some schools are even more mm-hmm. aggressive in coordinating. But I also want to say this, and I think this is important. Parents should also, I want to bring it back to Broward County. Parents should also be asking, what is the protocol for the police and schools. In Broward County, three sheriff's deputies arrived very quickly after the shooting began and stood down. They didn't go in and confront yeah. the shooter. They also didn't clear the school. The school actually, crews had left, and they were still standing down. And many of those children bled out. 
If they had cleared that school and allowed the EMTs to go in, several more children might have survived. What are the protocols for this? What, how, are the, the, how are the city sheriff's office and the schools uh, coordinating and discussing this? When there is a, it, it, the other thing in, in Parkland, there was a school safety officer, an armed school safety officer who stood in a stairwell cowering yeah. in a corner. He didn't confront. What is the point of these, these school safety officers if they're not going to have the courage to confront these shooters? That is their job. It is not the job of a child to, to, to confront a shooter. It's the, it's the job of the school safety officer. What kind of training are they getting? Um, you know, what, what are teachers going to be allowed to say to their children, to the children in their classrooms? Are they going to be allowed to give their own opinion? Um, will the teachers be walking out? What happens to the school day if the teachers walk out of a classroom? What do the remaining children do? Well, how does this set kids up to be bullied if, if they choose they choose to sit. I'm telling you right now, if I ban my children, of course they would never get up and leave the classroom, but I've said you are not allowed mm-hmm. because I actually, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a weirdo. I think that, that you know, school is for learning and not for political act, okay. activist behaviors. But so, you know, these are the questions parents should be asking. I'm, all, I'm always a big advocate of asking questions. School boards, principals, uh, superintendents, they should all be pillared with these kinds of questions. They should have to answer these questions. After all, these are public schools. This is taxpayer dollars. And as a, you know, as as a as a as a as a parent of public school children, I deserve these answers. So I, you know, the last thing I'll say is I really encourage parents to become more active. Ask questions. You, there's nothing wrong. With, you may not get the answers. You may not get the answers you want. But by asking questions, you're indicating, you're signaling that there are parents who disagree with this action. That goes a long way. Very good, Julie. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, You know, for our viewers, this is a a very important issue. We all want to ensure that our families are safe and our kids are safe when they're in schools, but we also have to look at what's wrong with the system, you know, what's working right, but also what has failed in our system and how we fix that rather than just uh, jumping to finding any solution and particularly solutions that are put forward that would um, uh, potentially take away constitutional freedoms and would not really fix the problems that led to uh, some of these heinous incidents. So thank you so much to all of our listeners. Um, This is the Independent Women's Forum, our Working for Women podcast. We hope you will join us again as we take on some very hot (laughs) topic, uh, hot button issues, but also very um, economic issues and and day-to-day issues that women and families are facing from a different perspective. So we hope you'll uh, tune in again to our next podcast. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, or stop by IWF.org for similar content.